Hello and welcome to an introduction to impedance matching. My name is Steve Ellingson. Here's an overview of this lecture. First, I'm going to talk about the applications of impedance matching in radio design. The two big applications are going to be maximum power transfer and uh, minimum reflection. However, there are others, some of which we may have referred to in a previous lecture. Some preliminary ideas about how to do impedance matching. We'll talk about reel-to-reel -reel matching using series and parallel resistances. Simple idea that you've probably already seen, hopefully. Reel-to-reel -reel matching using transformers. Again, something you've hopefully already seen. And then the very simple idea of complex to real valued impedance matching using reactance canceling. Very simple idea. What we're going to end up with at the end of this lecture is the notion of discrete two-component L-type matching, and that's going to be the topic of a future lecture. But I want to get you to that point by introducing some of these other ideas first. So first, why impedance matching? Well, maximizing power transfer between two ports. That is achieved by conjugate matching. So if we have a source impedance and we have a load impedance, and we have to implement some kind of interface between the two, then generally we're going to want one impedance to be the conjugate of the other because that maximizes power transfer between two ports. You hopefully know this from a previous course. However, another application might be eliminating reflections between two ports. Most EE students encounter this in electromagnetics uh, because that's where reflections or the wave nature of voltages and currents uh, come into play, and in RF those notions are very important. Uh, eliminating reflection between two ports requires that Z sub S equals Z sub L, uh, not conjugate related, but actually equal to each other. You know this must be true because reflection coefficient, voltage reflection coefficient, is Z sub L minus Z sub S over Z sub L plus Z sub S. For the voltage reflection coefficient to be zero, Z sub L must equal Z sub S. By the way, this is the same as saying voltage standing wave ratio equals one. Right? If you want a voltage standing wave ratio of one, then you want to eliminate reflections. You want Z sub S equals Z sub L. If you want to maximize power transfer, then you want to do this. And these are two different things but they're both considered impedance matching. In both cases, we're trying to specify an impedance and then achieve it. A third application of impedance matching is deliberate mismatching to adjust the gain of a two port. We may have seen in the previous lecture that uh, amplifier design is often done by implementing specific impedances at the input and output ports. And by doing that, we can adjust the gain of the two port. Similarly, we can adjust or influence the stability of a two port by implementing specific impedances at the input and output. So these are also impedance matching tasks in the sense that we are somehow trying to achieve a certain kind of impedance and typically we're trying to interface it to another kind of impedance. Maybe 50 ohms, that's typically the case in most RF engineering tasks, but not all. Okay, matching for max power or minimum reflection. So here's the idea drawn out in a little bit more detail. Here's a Thevenin and equivalent circuit model for the source. Right. It has a voltage source in series with an impedance Z sub S. We have the two port, which is actually a matching two port. This is the two port that we are trying to create to implement the match. So there's some circuitry that's going to go in here that is going to cause that impedance match to happen. And typically, we would like the TPG to be about 1. We would like the power available from the source uh, to be roughly equal to the power uh, delivered to the load, because otherwise we're wasting power. So typically, this is the case, but not always. In fact, we're going to show some cases where you might not want to do that. And then the load is over here. So looking this way into the two port, which is doing the matching, we have Z sub in. Looking into the output, we have Z sub out. And then Z sub S over here and Z sub L. So typically we're going to somehow try to interface Z sub S and Z sub L, and what we need to know is some relationship with Z sub in and Z sub out. So for conjugate matching, the thing that maximizes power transfer, you know that Z sub in 
should equal z sub s conjugate. And z sub out should equal z sub l conjugate. For reflectionless matching, those impedances should be equal. Everything we're going to do in the next uh, few lectures will apply to either one of these cases uh, in the sense that all we need to know is what impedance we're trying to get to and once we know that then we can design circuitry to to make that happen okay matching real valued impedances using series and parallel resistances the simplest way you can imagine doing this a sophomore who is two weeks into their first circuit theory course can can do this kind of matching so first what we do is we say we're interested only in real valued impedances so z sub l becomes r sub l z sub s becomes r sub s and if r sub s is greater than r sub l then we can make the match happen simply by introducing some more resistance the additional resistance we need is r sub s minus r sub l and that's because when we add these two resistances up the total is r sub s match complete and note here that conjugate matching and reflectionless matching in this case are the same thing. Now, if R sub S is less than R sub L, then this method here is not going to work. What you need is to reduce the resistance of R sub L. The way you do that is to introduce a parallel resistance. You know this works because when you combine a resistor in parallel with another resistor, the resulting impedance is less. Right? So, you can work this out. You'll find that the value of the resistance you need is R sub S, R sub L over R sub L minus R sub S. The parallel combination of this resistor then and this resistor will be R sub S. Uh, by the way, don't take my word for it. Make sure you can prove this. It's a very important thing just to make sure we're all on the same baseline in terms of our abilities here. So pros of this approach. One is essentially infinite bandwidth. Resistors have great bandwidth. Ideal resistors have infinite bandwidth. Uh, practical resistors have somewhat less than infinite bandwidth for a variety of reasons. But if you need a very, very broad band match, this is certainly one way to do it. Simple. Here's the big con to this approach, and that is it's lossy. The TPG here will always be less than one and potentially by a lot. If the difference between the impedances is large, then you will end up dissipating a lot of power in the matching two port. And that's typically not desirable. In fact, that's usually enough to eliminate this approach from consideration. So typically we don't see this done very often. From time to time we see it done and uh, it's an important technique to know about because it's intermittently useful, but it is not a, a very common thing to do. We can use transformers to match real valued impedances. The idea is this. The ratio of impedances at a transformer, if the input impedances are R sub S and R sub L, is given by the ratio of number of turns in the coil. So if we have N turns in this coil and M turns in this coil, then N over M is equal to the square root of the ratio of the impedances. So you can convert impedances into other impedances simply by selecting the correct ratio of turns on either side of the transformer. So this has uh, the advantage of having very large bandwidth because transformers tend to have large bandwidth, not as large as resistors because there's various imperfections in, in uh, coils that cause them to have reactances which uh, are bandwidth limiting, but nevertheless very large bandwidths, maybe bandwidths on the order of two to one, for example. They're simple, uh, they're reciprocal in the sense that you can turn them around in the circuit and they work the same way and relatively low losses uh, TPGs uh, on the order of uh, minus 0.5 to minus 1 uh, dB or so is, is pretty typical uh, for an RF transformer that's used in this application so much better than using a resistor in that case and if you're trying to avoid losing too much power then this is uh, much more attractive you also have the option for a free single-ended to differential mode conversion. Now, you may or may not have encountered this idea before, uh, but there's this dichotomy between single-ended signals and differential signals. Typically, a single-ended signal is recognizable because it has an explicit uh, earth or ground connection uh, such as this, whereas a differential connection has no such explicit ground. We say as a virtual ground, uh, which is 
somewhere uh, in between those two conductors. So the currents on a differential signal are equal and symmetrical, whereas the signal on a single-ended uh, connection is entirely defined by what's happening on one conductor and the other one's just a ground. We use both kinds of signal transmission, commonly in RF, so it is frequently a task that we face to convert between single-ended differential and back. And if you also have to change the impedance, then the transformer is attractive because you can do both at once. The reason transformers are able to do this is because they're not physically connected. Uh, they are connected only in the sense that there is this coupling magnetic field, which couples the two coils, which is the thing that transfers power back and forth. And that magnetic field could care less about uh, whether the signals are differential or signal ended on either side. It just doesn't know. Uh, there's no way it can, it can respond to that or be sensitive to it. So you can use a transformer to convert back and forth. Now a con is that uh, transformers, while well, they're bulky, they're expensive, and they're a potential EMC hazard. It's hard to make these transformers smaller than, say, the size of your uh, fingernail. Uh, in some cases, somewhat smaller, but uh, there's certainly a lower bound on how small you can make a transformer because it has to have all the stuff in it. It has to have coils, has to have an, a ferrite core of some kind to contain the magnetic field, uh, and so on. They're expensive because you need all that stuff, and they're a potential EMC hazard. EMC means electromagnetic compatibility because this magnetic field is extending out beyond the transformer. And to the extent that the magnetic field intercepts something like a chip or another transmission line, it can couple signals back and forth. So transformers are fairly notorious for picking up stray signals and delivering signals to places where they shouldn't be. Another con is transformers are typically limited UHF and below. The reason for that is there's always some capacitance between these coils, right? Each turn of the coil looks like somewhat like a parallel plate capacitor. So there's always a little bit of stray capacitance and that makes it resonant. So there will always be some frequency above which the transformer just doesn't work right anymore. It starts to look like a resonant circuit instead. Typically that frequency is below one gigahertz uh, in some cases, it might be as small as just a few megahertz. So transformers typically do not work very well or are rarely seen above a few hundred megahertz. So I would say, and this is not a firm number, it's hard to see applications. It's hard to find applications for transformers much above 300 megahertz or so. Not saying it doesn't happen, just saying that it, it gets really difficult to use these above uh, that frequency. Hey, another way we can do matching is by canceling reactants. So in this scenario, we're going to go from real to complex. And we can do that by first matching the real part using any of the methods that we've already talked about. And then we can deal with the rest of it, that is the imaginary part, simply by tacking on the correct reactants. And we refer to this as reactants canceling, although you might not be canceling in the strict sense, you are simply doing this in two steps, uh, real to real, and then introducing the correct reactants to achieve the complex valued impedance you're looking for. So this is very, very simple, relatively less bandwidth. And the reason this has relatively less bandwidth is because reactances are frequency dependent, right? You know that the reactance of a capacitor is 1 over j omega c. You know the reactance of an inductor is j omega l. In both cases you have omega, so these are frequency dependent. That means that whatever you do to achieve a match at one frequency won't work uh, at some other frequency, or at least not as well. And of course you will have whatever pros and cons apply to the real-to-real -real part. Nevertheless, it's kind of uh, useful to know or to keep in mind that this is a possibility. From time to time, this kind of thing comes up. All right, now I want to expand a little bit on this idea of the limited bandwidth of reactants canceling. What I'm showing here is a plot that goes from 0 megahertz to 30 megahertz. So this is the high end of the HF band. And um, a reactance uh, that's going from minus 200 ohms to plus 200 ohms, uh, 
And then I'm showing what reactances we get uh, for two different components. This component here is a one microhenry inductor. And this here is a 100 picofarad capacitor. Now remember the reactants here is omega L. The reactants here is minus one over omega C. It's interesting to note that in both cases, the reactant steadily increases. This is a simple uh, truth. In fact, it is a, a deep truth. There's a theorem associated with this that uh, the reactance continuously increases with increasing frequency. That means that we can't easily synthesize reactances which stay constant with frequency. For example, if we add these two things together to achieve some kind of cancellation, well, the reactance of that thing will be the sum of these two things, which means that we can cancel reactants only at one frequency. And at all other frequencies, the combination of those two things will be some other value. We can't plan on being able to cancel reactants over a large range of frequencies with any particular accuracy. And this is a serious, in fact, fundamental limitation of uh, this approach of using reactances. Nevertheless, it's going to turn out that the other advantages of reactances and discrete reactances is so compelling that we're willing to put up with this. And in fact, this bandwidth limitation is not always as great as you might think. Even though we can only do, for example, exact canceling at one frequency, it turns out that frequently what we get at nearby frequencies is good enough that we can consider that to be okay. All right, the method we're gonna use going forward, or at least the first major class of methods, is going to be discrete two component L matching. And this approach, we're going to be converting using two reactances. Reactances could be either uh, capacitors or inductors. That will be determined by the uh, impedances on either side. Uh, but the shape of the two port here will be an L shape, which is why we give it this name. It's an L depending on how you look at it. And this is the thing we're going to explore going forward. Now, before I talk about this, and I'm not going to talk about it at all in this lecture, it's going to be the next lecture, but before I'm, I get to that, I just want to point out that we're giving up the idea of complex to complex terminations. Uh, you might ask, and fairly, well, shouldn't, uh, isn't the most general thing to go from a complex valued impedance to a complex valued impedance, and shouldn't we look at that? Well, I have two answers to that. One is that nearly all matching problems that we encounter in RF engineering involve at least one real value termination. And usually what happens 95% of the time is we're trying to convert some impedance to 50 ohms, which is a real valued impedance. So in fact, this particular approach, going complex to real, is a complete answer for many, I would say by far most uh, of the problems that we will encounter. Not all, but most. My second answer to this question is that this is not less general. In fact, we can always construct a complex to complex match using combinations of real to complex impedance matching two ports. For example, if we want to go complex to complex, what we can do is go complex to real, and then we can have another two port that goes real to complex, and we can just connect them together. And then the cascade combination of these two things is complex to complex. And typically there will be a bunch of simplification that can happen here in the circuitry that will reduce this to a uh, much simpler circuit. So this is one approach to get a complex to complex impedance match uh, if all you know how to do is to do real to complex matching. One other approach is that you can do an L match to match the real parts, that is real to real matching, and then use one additional component to match the reactants. So for example, you can go complex to real, for example, and then add a series reactants, Jx, and then you will have complex. And then again, you can combine these things typically to get some uh, simpler circuit. So there is no limitation in this. Uh, we can get complex, complex terminations quite, quite simply. This concludes this introduction to impedance matching.